Good afternoon and welcome to the February edition of the Abe Legislative Issues and Public Policy webinar. And our topic for today is none other than Lewis Latimer with a focus on Black History Month. And so as many of you know, Lewis Latimer it was an inventor. Today you'll find out about the other parts of his life so much more than just invention. And he worked with some of the leading inventors of the day. Um, most notably, Thomas Alva Edison uh, with the invention of the light bulb and had an excellent contribution to the light bulb in terms of the filament. But there's so much more to his life story. And we have two great panelists with us today uh, to share more about Lewis Latimer's life. And most importantly, how that impacted our industry, the energy industry, and the important things for us to take away because they are still impact uh, to this day. And so with us today, we have Hugh Price and Steve Mitnick. And I'll give a brief bio of those two gentlemen, and then we'll bring them in uh, for a discussion uh, on Lewis Latimer. I want to encourage all of us in the audience to leverage the question and answer Q&A boxes uh, should be at the bottom of your screen. And I'm sure you'll have questions during this webinar. And I ask that you use the Q&A um, for your questions. We'll be monitoring those questions during the session and the ones that are appropriate to fil filter in in the conversation, we certainly will do that. And we always reserve some time at the end of the program uh, to field your questions directly. So it is an interactive session. That's how we do our webinars here at Abe. And so we certainly invite audience uh, participation. So um, with no further ado, let me introduce our panelists for the day. And I'll start with Hugh Price. So, uh, and this is his brief bio. Both of these gentlemen have extensive uh, careers and uh, a lot going on, but I'll, I'll share the bio. One of Hugh Price's ancestors fought in the American Revolution at Valley Forge under the command of General George Washington. When another of his ancestors escaped slavery and reached Boston, celebrated abolitionists like Frederick Douglass and William Lloyd Garrison rallied to thwart his recapture and return, inspiring the poem from Massachusetts to Virginia by John Greenleaf Whittier. A third ancestor, Louis Latimer, was a noted inventor who belonged to the Edison pioneers and created a carbon filament which made light bulbs more durable, affordable, and energy efficient for everyday use. Profoundly shaped by this unique ancestry, Mr. Price is a longtime civil rights leader, activist, and public intellectual. As president of the National Urban League from 1994 to 2003, he launched the league's historic campaign for African-American achievement, spearheaded pressure on the federal government to, to combat police brutality and racial profiling, vigorously defended affirmative action and helped repair frayed relations between the black and Jewish communities. Over the course of his unorthodox career, he has been an editorial writer for the New York Times, senior vice president in charge of the division at WNET 13, which produces such acclaimed PBS series as Great Performances, Nature and American Masters. He's been the vice president of the Rockefeller Foundation non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and visiting professor at the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton University. He currently serves as a national, on the National Commission on Social, Emotional, and Academic Development. Mr. Price is the author of five books, the latest of which is his memoir, The African-American Life. His articles have been published in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Phi Delta Kappen, and the Chronicle of Higher Education. His numerous television appearances range from Meet the Press and the News Hour with Jim Lehrer to Charlie Rose and the O'Reilly Factor. <clears throat> He's a recipient, recipient of honorary degrees from Yale University, Amherst College, and Northeastern University. He's a fellow at the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and a member of the American Philosophical Society. Uh, audience, please join me in welcoming Hugh Price. Also with us today is another friend, uh, Steve Mitnick. Uh, Steve is the executive editor of Public Utilities Fortnightly, 
and president of its parent company, Lines Up Incorporated, based here in Arlington, Virginia. He also authors the weekly digital magazine, This, this Half Fortnight from Public Utilities Fortnightly. He previously was a member of a leadership team of energy consulting practices at McKinsey and Company, Marsh and McLemon, and PHH Hager Bailey. Uh, he served as well as president of the Transmission Developer Company, Conjunctions LLC, and as chief energy advisor to the governor, the former governor of New York State. His book, Lines Down, How We Pay, Use, Value, Grid Electricity Amid the Storm, was published in June of 2013. His other book, Lewis Latimer, The First Hidden Figure, was published in November of 2020. And he has a book, William, Women Leading Utilities, The Pioneers and Paths to Today and Tomorrow, uh, that was published last year in May of 2021. His most recent book about the military veterans in the, in the utilities industry, Front Lines to Power Lines, co-authored with Rachel Moore, was published in November of 2021. He received the 2021 Leadership Award from the Keystone Policy Center in large part because of his books, his books on Lewis Latimer and on women leaders. He has testified before utility regulatory commissions in six states, also the District of Columbia, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, FERC, and in Canada. Early in his career, he was a member of the faculty of Georgetown University and taught micro microeconomics, macroeconomics, and statistics. He has an MBA from the Wharton School uh, at the University of Pennsylvania and two BS degrees from Rensselaer Polytechnical Institute in physics and in history and political science. So again, join me in welcoming our guest, Steve Mitnick to the webinar. Gentlemen, gentlemen, first of all, I wanna thank you for taking the time out. I know you're both busy, but you took time out to be with us here at AID and particularly around uh, Lewis Latimer and black history. So what I wanna do is, um, spend some time with each of you individually and then get you into this really um, a conversation uh, about uh, Lewis Latimer and uh, more importantly or equally important is uh, how his life impacts our industry today and some takeaways um, that, that you've observed. So um, let me start with you. Um, I mentioned in your bio that you were president of the National Urban League. And um, you want to touch on that a little bit? Uh, we, we have done uh, work with the Urban League. And sure. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, leading the National Urban League was the job of a lifetime. It was truly a dream come true. And I was appointed in uh, 1994 and uh, served in that position for nine years. We were deeply involved in a number of programmatic areas. We had a campaign for African American achievement, which was designed to encourage our children to strive to do well in school. Uh, we had programs which fostered home ownership and job training and entrepreneurship. And we were also in the thick of uh, a lot of the public policy battles. I was deeply involved in pressuring President Clinton to use the uh, power and resources of federal government to try to stem the tide of police brutality and racial profiling. Uh, we were very involved in uh, efforts to close the digital divide and to defend uh, affirmative action from assault from every side. And, but not everything we did was in front of the camera, you might say. Um, many members of the audience may recall the Fortune magazine issue called the New Black Power, which focused on African Americans who were climbing uh, near the top and to the top of corporate America. I'm proud to say that was my idea, Tracy. Um, I proposed that to the editors of Fortune. I even suggested uh, five or six story, story ideas that could comprise an issue. Um, they took that idea and ran with it and it became uh, the new black power that uh, uh, major new uh, initiative by Fortune magazine. So we did a lot of things up front on TV, behind the scenes. And we we're also very involved in trying to heal relations between the Black and Jewish communities, which were very frayed at the time I became the head of the league. Appreciate that. Yeah, you, you talk about the work behind the scenes. And so uh, I, I appreciate you sharing that with our audience. Um, as an activist and leading an activist organization, civil rights organization, 
so much happens uh, that we don't read about. We, we get the end result. And so it's helpful for us to learn um, your contributions. Um, but we made, maybe if I could say, we made another one along those lines. We were traveling at one point with some of the major editors of Time Magazine, and we got into a discussion. It was right at the time of the Million Man March, and we got into a discussion with them about how the major news magazine should cover the march. And we said, I was with Janetta Cole, the great former president of Spelman, and we said, well, one way to think about covering it is to focus on Farrakhan because he organized it. But the other big question is, why are a million men and their sons coming? And why don't you do that? And that became the full color, joyous story in Time Magazine called We Too Sing America. And that came directly right. from a conversation we had on an airplane behind the scenes, um, but that had huge impact in how America saw that march. Indeed. Yeah, I love the focus. You know, you can focus on one leader or, or the million men and their sons who were there. Right. So great redirect and, and, you know, fantastic influence. So, you know, um, what I wanted, one other question. Um, well, another question. So your lineage uh, and where Lewis Latimer fits uh, into that. So when did you first find out that you were related to Lewis Latimer? Well, my mother was a professional archivist, and she and her sister were deep into ancestry. And so, especially my mother, because, you know, we were in the household, but both of them used to work my brother and me over and say, you know, you've got this famous uncle who was a great inventor. And I would say, yeah, but right now I got to go play baseball. Um, so we'll talk about that someday when I grow up. Well, when I grew up and got to college, I happened to date a young lady who lived in Brooklyn, and we were living in Washington at the time. And I used to go up to New York to uh, visit with her. And my mother arranged for me to stay with Louis Latimer's daughter, who we called Aunt Louise. And Aunt Louise put me up in the house, let me sleep in the master bedroom. And she would always say to me, I'm 20 at the time and the hormones are, are, are firing. And she'd say, I want you to come sit for breakfast. I'm going to tell you all about your famous Uncle Louis and his, his parents, your great, great grandparents, George Latimer, the escaped slave. And I'd say, Aunt Louise, right now, I got to go to Brooklyn. So please tell me how to get on the Brooklyn Queens Expressway so I can go to Brooklyn. And we'll talk about Louis Latimer another time. And of course, I never did. So knucklehead that I am, or that I was, I missed that opportunity to learn about him, about his sister, who was my great grandmother, and about their parents, who were the very famous escaped slaves, uh, George and Rebecca Latimer. Uh, I've played catch up over the years, and uh, his granddaughter, Winifred Latimer, who was the engine behind the creation of the wonderful Lewis Latimer Museum, was on my case for a lot of years to be on the board, and I was always on the make professionally. So I was flying here and there doing this job and the other, and finally, our executive director caught up with me about two years ago, and I had no more excuses because I was retired. And uh, I happily joined the board, and um, I'm having a great time. Fantastic. 20 years old, Brooklyn, New York. Hey, yeah, I can only imagine. Too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I indeed. Had to go to Brooklyn. I had to go to Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> understood. Understood. And then we have, we have Steve, who chronicled his life, you know, Louis Latimer's life. So, so Steve, um, before we dive into Louis Latimer, a little bit more, because, you know, in your editorial role, um, you're dealing with trends uh, in the industry, and we want to touch on that. Could you, you share what you see as trends and it, it ties potentially to, to Lewis Latimer? Yeah, the biggest trends that drive strategy and regulation and, and policy in the industries today, electric, natural gas, and water utilities, First and foremost, there's um, ESG, that's um, an acronym for environmental, social, and governance, but the tremendous pressure on utilities uh, and, and everyone in globally to, um, to not just perform, for companies to not just perform financially very well, but also across measurable social metrics including um, 
uh, their environmental performance, uh, their diversity, how they're governed, uh, how they treat their communities and their internal communities as well. But of course, also there's decarbonization where, where uh, many companies are working very hard and uh, accomplishing a lot to drive down the emissions of global uh, gases. So that's so important. Um, there's tremendous uh, focus on cybersecurity. The threats there are tough. So that's a big trend too. And, um, and also, I guess I would say lastly, the changing work culture. Uh, uh, we have a far more diverse work culture and lots of young people coming in, tremendously talented, the digitization of how we work and how utilities uh, respond and finally resilience. The resilience of our utility services um, amid climate change threats and, and just threats of all kinds uh, from mother nature and, um, and from mankind. Indeed, indeed. You, you just said a mouthful. Um, when we talk about ESG, you know, we look at that and you and I have had these conversations before where um, you know, now so many more things are, you know, companies have to report on ESG in the, in the annual report and all those letters matter. And, you know, in the energy space, you know, environmental, social governance, you know, very much on the uh, forefront, particularly for uh, investor-owned utilities, you know, shareholders have expectations, communities have expectations. So you're right. Um, wonderful time to be in the industry, um, but it certainly is full of challenges. And you you got your finger on the pulse. So with everything that you're doing, you took the time to research and write about Lewis Latimer. So, so what prompted that? Well, I, I didn't have any choice um, <laughs> uh, really to, to take that time because um, events, uh, finally um, uh, came to the fore, uh, you know, building over the decades, but uh, particularly in the spring of 2020 with the murder of George Floyd, um, it just uh, uh, maybe well, well too late, but uh, woke up uh, so many uh, Americans uh, to, to not just accept the status quo, but to take action. Um, and I had known a little bit about Lewis Latimer. I have a, a great buddy who is a giant in, in our industry, David Owens. And he had, uh, from time to time, he had told me a bit about uh, what Lewis Latimer had done to start the electricity industry. I didn't take that much notice, uh, but I was um, I was compelled to uh, to really find out more about him and to see if um, then it was just the more I read, the more I researched, the more I talked to people um, around the country and historians and went to libraries and bought up every shred of of uh, documentary information about him and the times that he lived through, uh, I couldn't stop. So, you know, I was, I was just, um, uh, and, and got to the point where I was just what, seven days a week for, uh, for about uh, five months. Uh, I have a day job. Um, my team uh, took over some of that so that I could plunge ahead. And uh, I got to where I was dreaming about this um, amazing genius polymath who uh, helped make the modern world. Indeed. Indeed, yeah, you mentioned, I, I see our, our chair, Talisa Tolliver is in the chat. And when you say David Owens, um, again, you know, iconic, a giant in the industry. And uh, yeah, not surprising that David put Lewis Latimer on your, your uh, radar. What I wanna share with the audience, Steve is modest. Uh, but when Steve uh, talked to us about the book, um, as he, the book sales, 100% of the proceeds from the book sale actually uh, fund scholarships. So uh, Public Utilities for Nightly, Steve, 
um, has funded what we call the Lewis Latimer scholarships. And when we discussed what Steve wanted to do with this, I said, well, what are the criteria? Is there anything you, you really want? And the only thing Steve said was, I want it to be needs-based. I want to help um, you know, a, a minority of diverse students to you know, get into the space. And, and I really want, um, I'm keying on those with need. And so um, every year, he's actually doubled the amount of uh, scholarships we give at the regional level, um, you know, thanks to Steve. So got to say it publicly because you're uh, very modest and we are very grateful. Oh, so, there's every reason for me to be even more modest, especially when the, the good folks at Abe, they kind of taught me that uh, I should have known this, is that the, you know, the 4-0 students, they get those scholarships. They're, they're going to Harvard and MIT or wherever, Howard. And so they're, they're good. But um, you know, right, right behind them is that next wave of tremendously talented young women and men. And, um, and sometimes it's, it's a little hard for them to get over the hump uh, financially to where they can um, pursue their dreams and careers and pitch in to help our country. So, and then the other thing was, uh, hey, you should be thanking the, 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 the big funders, Excel Energy, uh, Dentons, Energy Impact Partners, and probably leaving out a couple, CPS Energy. They're the ones that really seeded that thing and are making it happen for our, we had our first six awardees. Um, and I got to interview uh, two or three of them. That was so much fun. Um, my wife was a little scared because normally I interview uh, CFOs and CEOs and she got kind of scared that I would be interviewing a 17 year old and uh, but I got through it they helped me through it <laughs> yeah you know what fantastic scholars these, these scholars are phenomenal phenomenal you know um, so the next thing I in, in preparing you both had some great touch points to Lewis Latimer, things that um, we don't know. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn back to Hugh. Um, you, what's your favorite story of, about your ancestor? Well, I think the most amazing thing about him is that his is actually a Horatio Alger story. Uh, Lewis Latimer's father left the family when L Lewis was about 10 years old. Lewis worked a lot of odd jobs when he was a little kid because the family needed the money. Um, he never got beyond grade school. Um, his mother went out to sea with a, with a, uh, on a ship to earn money as a steward. And so he was on his own. At one point, he was in the equivalent of an orphanage from which he escaped with his brother. I guess escaping oppression is sort of a family trait. Um, and uh, he enlisted in the Navy when he was 15 years old, served in the Civil War. And when he came out, he talked his way into a job with a major patent law firm in uh, Boston. Um, he taught himself how to make uh, technical drawings and uh, ended up being promoted to chief draftsman for the law firm. Um, and he did the drawings for Alexander Graham Bell's application to get the first patent for the telephone. And from that base, he navigated his way into the electricity industry. He became an inventor. He supervised the installation of lights in major buildings in New York City and Montreal. He ran a bulb manufacturing operation in London. Um, he was a poet. I mean, he's an utterly incredible man. The older I get, the more I appreciate how many dimensions there were to him. And so there's just so much about his life that we as adults can understand and also that I think young people uh, would, would profit from understanding. Um, he worked in the American economic mainstream. He blow, broke glass ceilings at every stage. He was never content to just be a draftsman. He wanted to invent. He was never content just to invent. He wanted to learn how to run the installation in major cities. He was never content to do that. He became Edison's go-to patent witness whenever there were patent infringement lawsuits against uh, him. So he always figured out what lies beyond what I'm doing. 
I'm going to master and perform what I'm doing, but I want to also be a player in the periphery and out beyond that. And so there's so many lessons about his life. And the other main takeaway, I'd say, I'm sorry to go on so long, but I, I often can't stop when I start talking about him. Um, he showed America how much talent resides in every segment of our population. And, and that is a, a lesson we need to absorb today and we need to act on today. He showed the talent that resides in the African-American community, Latino community, uh, gay and lesbian, LGBT, female, every segment of our society. And if we're going to be competitive in the world, we need to tap, cultivate, and position and promote all of our talent. And just imagine what would have happened to the lighting industry if Lewis Latimer had not been on the scene. Imagine what would have happened to Bell's patents if Lewis Latimer did not know how to draw, tech, make technical drawings, which are works of art. Um, so there are just so many takeaways from his life and his, res his legacy resonates really powerfully today. Um, and, and that's why it's so important that all of Americans understand. And lastly, I'd say, you know, we're in a time in our history when some segments of the white community are casting aspersions on the contributions of black folks in building this country. There are some people who suggest that only white people built America. And that's just wrong. It's factually wrong. Our folks made modest contributions. Our folks made momentous contributions. But Latimer made momentous contributions to the building of America. And that's why his story and the story of some of the many others needs to be understood. And that's frankly why the book that Steve wrote is so critically important in that effort. Appreciate the comments, appreciate the comments. And uh, we, we have some idea of your passion, uh, both you and Steve, for making sure that uh, his legacy, Lewis Latimer's le legacy remains. And, and again, a guard against uh, the, the, the challenges that you mentioned, you know, how history is, is uh, recorded and archived um, and how it remains relevant and living. So. Um, appreciate that. Steve, Steve, you in, in your research um, have, have some Latimer stories as well uh, that you learned. So um, what, what is your favorite uh, or favorite? There's, Lewis Latimer there's so much, uh, it's just more and more. And so it's hard to do. One thing it uh, reminds uh, those that love history uh, that uh, when we say that uh, black history is American history, boy, just, just look at Lewis Latimer's life and the, and the people that he went through. He was the Forrest Gump of uh, the second half of the 19th century and first quarter of the 20th century. And, and all the great names, he was uh, either one degree or two degrees of separation from. But um, maybe today it's best to, one of my favorites would be how he interacted with, um, uh, people that uh, with white men who dominated uh, power, technology and business through that whole period. And, um, and so he, uh, you know, when he worked with uh, 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 Bell, Graham Bell, um, it is, uh, we don't have all the evidence. It is extremely questionable whether we would say today that Bell was the inventor of the telephone, but for Latimer. Latimer got him over, over the hump, by the way, during Valentine's weekend in 1876. But for Lewis Latimer, it would have been one of Bell's competitors that got that patent. So uh, now Bell was, uh, and through his whole life, uh, little reported, he was quite racist and, uh, and not just towards Latimer, his career till his death, he did some despicable things uh, despite his achievement. Um, and so, but uh, Latimer, you know, was, uh, was, was instrumental to him. Then after some period of time, he gets picked up by Hiram Maxim, who was also a tremendous inventor and let's say next to Edison was the man closest to inventing the light bulb. He, Maxim was Edison's big competitor. 
Well, Maxim heard about Latimer and his talent, and he found Latimer, and his first remark was a little bit of a racist kind. Con- oh, oh, you're a Negro? Uh, you know, because he didn't expect that, right? He, he heard a lot about this guy. Oh, what do we have here? Um, but Maxim, he was, the, he was a consummate. He was going to use anyone to become famous and rich. And he just gave Latimer more and more responsibility. By the, by the time uh, we got to the 1880s, Latimer was pretty much running everything. Uh, in Latimer's lighting company and, um, and, and was off to the races as far as electrifying uh, Philadelphia and uh, Montreal. And, uh, and when he went to England, now he, Latimer was embraced by the people of Montreal. Uh, he, he was, um, but when he, when he ran the factory, Maxim's factory in London, uh, they were like, who the heck is this guy as our boss? And it was a really tough experience for him. And he and his wife, uh, Latterman's wife had to go back. And then finally, when he got to Edison and one, maybe one of the funnest stories about Latimer and Edison is that at that point, Latimer was the biggest uh, competitor to Edison as they were all racing to get credit for the invention of the light bulb. So of course Edison had huge resources. So he had his big lawyers all that he sued Latimer for patent infringement. Poor Latimer, he had no lawyers. He was out of his little apartment. And so after uh, two or three years, he got beat down and Edison's lawyers won. Turned around a few months later, Edison hired Latimer because he, he was, Edison was a smart guy. And the thing finally we could say about Edison was, yes, he, you know, he was a very talented, tremendous energy. He did so many great things uh, as far as invention, but he was, he was particularly an organizational man. He developed a tremendous research and development uh, organization. And he didn't care what you looked like, if you were talented. And so there in the Edison organization, he was so loved by the white men, the, the, the greatest scientists and engineers of the age. And he ran into every once in a while, uh, someone who wasn't that nice to him. Latimer just kept going and going and going. Uh, so I think that's my favorite part. You know, if I could interject is one of the, yeah. one of the crazy things about this, when you think about his amazing, Latimer's amazing contributions, is that the most recent authoritative biography of Thomas Edison contained absolutely no mention of Lewis Latimer. A very recent major documentary on PBS about Thomas Edison contained no mention of Lewis Latimer. So there's a lot of work to be done to to spread the word and spread the legacy and to let the world know that this black inventor who was the son of fugitive slaves helped build this country. And as it's this wonderful line that Jennifer Beals has in the Showtime series called um, um, The L Word. She says, when I ever think, when I ever, I think of Lewis Latimer whenever I switch on the lights. Mm-hmm. I, right. I think we shouldn't just think of Lewis Latimer. I think we should thank Lewis Latimer whenever we switch on the lights. <laughs> but, um, and yeah, that's because why if I, I can, you know, yeah. More specifically, so as an engineer, what did Latimer do? That was, he had a number of patents. And by the way, Max got a few other patents that were probably Latimer's, okay? So, yeah, yeah. so he had patents, but the two biggest things was Edison famously or infamously, he wanted to get credit for the light bulb. So he did his, you know, lots of experiments and he got a filament that the, the thing lasted depending upon how you, uh, what source you're looking at, maybe 12 to 14 hours. That wasn't gonna work. And Edison knew that, but he patented it. And by the way, he shoved that thing through the patent office in about one month, which is amazing. Okay, so therefore Edison is the inventor of the light bulb. The thing is not commercially viable because the Latimer, the, the filament would not last, but at that time, there were lots of inventors working in Europe and in the US, 
And Latimer's work was known. Remember, I talked about that lawsuit. And Latimer had a, a patent, a, a filament that would last for hundreds of hours. So that was that was really big. That's mom that's that's momentous. That's momentous. It's really big. Let's not forget the second thing, which was real break. Edison was obsessed with a good thing, which is he didn't want to just have rich people have electric lighting. He wanted everyone at all stations, economic stations, and worldwide, all the continents, to have uh, electric lighting. And But he couldn't make it happen because the bulb and the filament could not be manufactured efficiently. It was too expensive. And so uh, my favorite patent uh, from Lewis Latimer was the process for manufacturing filaments, which also included the screw in, ball, the screw in uh, part and the bulb. And that was a real breakthrough, which Edison immediately uh, absconded with, paid no attention to who it was patented to, and he took that off. And therefore, in 1884 and 1885, that's when lighting went global. And, um, and so that was, uh, that was the second thing that it's Latimer that did that. I'd like to mention quickly two other patents that were very significant. Um, <laughs> the first, uh, when you reach my age, um, this one's particularly significant. It's the water closet for passenger trains. Uh, if someone my age had been traveling on a passenger train before that invention, it would have been a very rough ride after a certain point in length. Uh, so he, he was one of the inventors of the, frankly, the little toilets that went into passenger cars. And the other thing he invented was a precursor to air conditioning. Um, so Latimer was a very, he had a very fertile mind and he was really fixated on how things work and how to make them work better. Yeah. Uh, and so Sometimes those kinds of contributions don't get the attention that the big splashy first mover gets, but these are the, the inventions that, as Steve said, that make these innovations affordable and available to everyone. And that's why I think I'm so struck by Jennifer Beale's statement that she thinks of him and we should thank him every time we turn on the lights because every day, every American has a light on somewhere in their lives and that is Latimer's enduring contribution. Those bulbs are descendants of Lewis Latimer's inventions. Indeed, indeed, a couple of things. I'm, I'm tracking the chat, what I wanna share with the audience again. Um, the the Q&A is here for you um, to, to pose your questions. I, I'm sure you, you got some, I've got plenty of them, so, uh, but I wanna entertain uh, the questions from the audience. Um, gentlemen, there, there's a project that has brought the two of you together. And I want you to talk a little bit uh, about the Lewis Latimer House Museum, uh, what's going on in that project. Um, share that uh, with the audience, if you would. So we'll start, where do we start? So Hugh, you're on the yeah. board, so sure. yeah. Um, the Latimer House Museum is a wonderful, wonderful embodiment of his life. It's in Flushing, Queens. Uh, it's a beautiful Victorian house, and it's a great way to have a tactile feel for who this remarkable man was. And unfortunately, you can't go up in the master bedroom and see where I slept when I was a knucklehead <laughs> trying to go see this girl in Brooklyn. But anyway, um, the 175th anniversary of his birth is coming up in September of 2023. And we're embarking on an effort to do several things. One, um, the interior hasn't been painted and the floors haven't been refinished since it opened to the public uh, at the turn of the century. So we want to do that. The second thing is we want to create a modern high-tech exhibition, public exhibition space. We have one video monitor in there. There's no interactivity. Um, and we have some displays where they're literally the, they're peeling off of the backing. So we want to create a modern, vibrant exhibition there. And then the third thing we want to do is create a virtual tour because we want the la experiencing Latimer and understanding him to be accessible to everyone anywhere in the world, not just the people who can find their way to Queens. So those are three enormous priorities. And Steve and the Public Utilities Fortnightly have been incredible partners in that. And I know Steve had some things to say about it as well. Yeah, we announced this campaign to raise some dollars uh, for the renovation of the Lewis Latimer House Museum. 
in time for his birthday on September 4th in 2023, 175th birthday. We announced that at the Nehruk luncheon on Monday, and we're gonna be working hard, and I know a lot of companies are getting, gonna join us in, in this. And, um, and for me, it, it's animated in a couple of ways, because yes, Lewis Latimer did so much for our industry, and yes, he's one of the most outstanding uh, business and technical um, founders uh, during our American history. So that is great. But also that house is very special because Latimer, he, at the same time as he was a, a giant in business, American business and technology, kind of the Silicon Valley of the day, all, all those other folks were uh, white and male. Um, at the same time at that house, it, it is emblematic of how he, he hosted the great intellectuals of the day in his house. Uh, the W.E. Du Bois, the great artists, the great painters and, uh, and great uh, writers in that house. So I think it says something about black history and American history at that time. But then I would say additionally, one thing maybe Hugh we haven't mentioned is he was amazing in, in terms of being a leader without respect to background. He, uh, he, he uh, was active in his uh, church, a uh, big church, and there were, that was an integrated church. We're talking Plessy versus For Ferguson days, at post Crookshank, and yet he navigated that. He was a leader in the veterans, the Civil War veterans, and, um, and he, he, the way, um, and so uh, across all ethnic bounds. So that's a special, special house that you didn't pay much attention to when you were a teenager, Hugh, but that's <laughs> something that we're gonna make beautiful and be a center where young people and adults can go and learn about uh, this nation's history. Uh, Tracy, I have no <laughs> shame when it comes to promoting the Latimer House Museum. Um, there's a great magazine called Ooh, Preservation. Okay. It is the official magazine of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. The Latimer House is the cover story in Preservation Magazine in the winter 2022 issue. Nice. And it's available both in print, but also you can go on to the website of Preservation Magazine and read this. There's no paywall. You can read the article there. And it will give you a real feel for how special the place is, as well as the extraordinary life of Louis Latimer. Well, that's fantastic. That is fantastic. What, what you two are doing, you teamed up, and it is so important, uh, the work that you're doing um, tirelessly to ensure that Lewis Latimer's legacy um, not only remains, um, but is accessible. So that, that is so key. I'm looking at one of the, the questions in the chat, and while you touched on it, uh, he, he, perhaps you can expound. So um, the question, you know, is what should we take away from the story of Latimer's resilience um, that will help young people today? I, I know in our prep, we talked about uh, young people. So uh, what, what about his resilience um, that'll help? Our well, I think there are, there are many traits of Lewis Latimer that young people would profit from studying. And you mentioned resilience. His determination to grow and to learn. He, he taught himself to be a draftsman, but he, he was always stretching his own intellectual and skill boundaries and always trying to figure out not only what is it am I doing and what have I been asked to do, but what else is this enterprise about? And where can I contribute even more value than I'm contributing now? Um, so that's one very important way of thinking about a job that I think is useful for young people to think about. Um, he was ambitious and a dreamer, but he was also very pragmatic. Um, and he understood how to navigate organizations, how they and people worked, and how to gain the confidence of people. And he was doing that in the mainstream economic system of this country. Um, and Latimer was also um, 
he bounced back. I mean, it, his 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 life was not a cakewalk. Um, at, at one point, he lost a job with Maxim's company, and he had to revert to being a barber. And this great inventor who had patents had to be a barber, but you can bet he was plan planning his reentry, and he bounced back and ended up with Thomas Edison, which is not a bad bounce back. Um, so there are just so many attributes of him, uh, of Latimer, that are extraordinary. And lastly, he was very focused on self-sufficiency, on providing for himself and providing for his family and doing whatever had to be done. He had no illusions about that. So there are just a lot of attributes that I think young people can look at and think about how that applies to their lives today. I also want to add, while I, I got the, the mic here, um, I was once asked sort of what is my dream coming out of a conversation like today? And, and I mentioned that the 175th anniversary of his birth is coming up in 2023. I think it would be amazing if the utility companies of this country made sure that all of their customers and all of their employees know who Lewis Latimer was and what he meant to the industry, what he meant to this country, and what he means to the young people today. So this is a plea to all utility companies, please try to tell his story. And this magazine article, and Steve's book, Great Ways to Tell It, please tell his story to all of your customers and all of your employees. And if that happens, every American will think of Lewis Latimer whenever they turn on the lights. Right, yeah, appreciate that. Yeah, you're right. And, and the chat is, is um, picking up on, on your statement. Not only think of Lewis Latimer, but thank Lewis Latimer. Thank him. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, yeah. And appreciate that, you know, with that and dream. I would, mm -hmm. I would, Go ahead, so we, you know, we love the history and, and the, the guy was, uh, you know, a renaissance man, genius, polymath. None of us, well, I know, speaking for myself, we're not. But we have models today. Bring it to today. I mean, I'm just, uh, I'm sure I'm going to offend someone by leaving out Rod West, Chris Womack, uh, Calvin Butler, Kevin Walker, Carla Peterman, Rudy Winner. I'm sorry, I, I, I left out a bunch of, of people. They're, they're there today. And uh, they are lifetime learners, always trying to think about how to advance the goals of their organizations, of their communities and customers. Sometimes it's tough because they have to navigate. You know, we have our, you know, we have our our ethnic side. Uh, I'm Jewish, you know, and and we have our you know business side. And these are tremendous successful leaders of our industry. They're, they're all around us today. And you know what? Right behind them are hundreds of really great young people that are, um, and, uh, that are coming up and they're leaders of tomorrow when we hand over the keys. So um, I, I think that's another way that we can say Latimer lives in us today. Good point, good point. And, and you're right, Steve, I mean, the other thing that, as you said, you would forget some folks, but I, I commend um, what you've done with Public Utilities for Nightly in, in, in um, highlighting uh, talent throughout the industry and uh, especially, uh, you know, talent that, that is diverse, okay? And, and in keeping that in the forefront, uh, I told you when I first, um, read your publication, I was, you know, young in the industry and I knew I was in, you know, as we used to say, deep carpet when I saw your magazine, you know, because it, you had to be up at the executive level and I, there, you know, it's public utilities 490. So the partnership has been great and um, your coverage of, of the things for, you know, diverse talent is, is phenomenal. So appreciate that. There was something that, that came up in our conversation um, you touched on a little bit, both of you as authors, um, we, we, we talk a lot in the industry about STEM, but then in our conversation, you talked about STEAM and how uh, the arts, uh, we're now recognizing that 
um, arts has a significant contribution to what we formerly known as uh, STEM. So Hugh, you want to touch on that a little bit? Louis Latimer that. gave that speech in 1880. 1880 to the Bridgeport Historical, uh, excuse me, Bridgeport Scientific Society, in which he had delivered a paper in which, in where he argued that art and science are integrally related. And keep in mind that he did all these magnificent technical drawings for patent applications, and the Smithsonian considers those drawings works of art. And so he, he argued that those two are intertwined. So in many respects, you know, we have talked for years about science, technology, engineering, and math, but he added the arts. And he was an apostle of STEAM, science, technology, engineering, art, and math, 130 years before the acronym even existed. So the man was a visionary and we've caught up with him. And uh, fortunately, and he also demonstrated through his career how mastery of those disciplines can equip you to be successful in the mainstream economy, which is something that research affirms now. But he was testimony to that, testament to that in the late 19th century and early 20th century. So he, he, he is a true visionary and um, his sense of the totality of disciplines that you need in order to be successful was spot on. Yeah. Indeed. How about you, Steve? And then I would add that today's leadership, uh, evident definitely over the last 20 years, has moved to where if you look at the CEOs now, there's a few engineers uh, still among them. I'm an engineer. Uh, please don't uh, be uh, biased against us. <laughs> but the engineers that are heading their organizations are great communicators. Uh, great at understanding people, their students of that, their students of humanities. And so, and you can see it, I'll, I'll you know, I can name and, you know, a number of that, this is something, we have a number of great women of all ethnic backgrounds that have risen to the top. And, um, and these are people that connect, that listen. And when I interview leaders about leadership skill, so often they talk about inspiring people, listening and learning from them, lifetime learning. And so it's not all um, uh, Euler's equations and, uh, and uh, Ohm's law. There's a lot more to it. And so that means that opens us up to the greatest, most dynamic people that are in this industry coming on up you can go as far as you as you, as it'll take you. As you Let me make one other point about STEAM, if I could. Steve Jobs understood STEAM mm. with his products. That, those are the differentiators for many Apple products. Um, ergonomics is industry speak for STEAM. Mm. Right. Automobile design, dashboard, blah, blah, blah. Ergonomics is industry speak for STEAM. The integration of art, user friendliness into the design of an otherwise and functioning of an otherwise mechanical device. So that's how far ahead Latimer was of the way we think about uh, modernity. Oh, and I have to footnote, you know, you mentioned to you that that famous speech was given to the Bridgeport and people may say, oh, Bridgeport, Connecticut, what's that? Well, with all due respect <laughs> to Bridgeport, in that day, in the 1870s and 1880s, Bridgeport, Connecticut was the Silicon Valley of the world. Right. And the greatest science and engineering and breakthroughs were happening there. So when he gave that speech, he was giving that speech to some of the most impactful um, uh, people of the time. Right. Indeed. Indeed, I got a question in the chat and I can't close without um, posing this um, because we have a question. How can I get involved in supporting the Latimer House? Someone um, wants to help. Yeah. Well, it, de it depends on, and can't get into people's business, but it depends on where the person is situated. Um, um, first, I would say, please feel free to contact me or you could contact Ran Yen, who is the uh, director of Latimer House. Uh, I think she's watching, so she could 
provide some contact information. Um, but the other way is if you're in the industry, we talked about ways in which industry can be supportive. Um, uh, perhaps you could induce your company, persuade your company to be supportive of this major effort to refurbish the house, uh, create a new exhibition. Um, you could be supportive of an effort to get your company to make sure that all of its customers and employees um, understand who Latimer was and uh, how he's, his legacy reg resonates to this day. Um, I see that Rand has posted her contact information. So I would say, please reach out to Rand and let, let's talk. Let's talk. Let's think about what your interests are, what contacts you have, and where you might be most interested in being supportive. We would welcome it. All right. Yeah, I see Rand. She's been great in, in uh, tracking in the, in the uh, chat. So, yeah, then, you know, there will be uh, an outpour in, you know, if I can think about how, how our audience responds, um, an outpouring to, to ensure that the work that you're doing is supported, that uh, Louis Latimer's legacy uh, will continue. Both of you are tirelessly working on that and I really you know speaking for the association as well appreciate the work that you do one of the things I I always ask um with my teams is you know what, what did we miss because I miss a lot <laughs> in, in general but uh we've got a couple minutes you know, tracked with the questions um what do we miss in this conversation that you really want to leave with this audience you're asking us or you're asking viewers uh, um well, I'm, I'm tracking the viewers. I'm asking the two of you. Well, I want to just add very quickly that uh, Louis Latimer lived during the second half of the 19th century and the first quarter of the 20th century. And um, we're all so proud of uh, being in uh, the, uh, the most wonderful nation on earth uh, from the Declaration on. Uh, but um, but there's a lot to American history. And, um, and these were uh, some of the toughest times in US history. And there was a lot of tough things that Latimer and, and by the way, he's one person that millions of, uh, of, of our fellow citizens were in bondage or coming out of them in the South and, uh, and a smaller number of free blacks in the, the so-called free blacks in the North and, um, and when you learn about Latimer, you learn about our history. And it really gives you tremendous insight about the greatness and the challenges that still uh, uh, confront us today that we, we want to uh, uh, form that more perfect union. So that's one thing I would add. Let me, let me also say, we didn't talk too much about the curricular implications of Latimer's life and work, but one of the wonderful things that the Latimer House Museum does is it offers what we call Tinker Lab programs where little kids go in and actually invent stuff. I've seen these little bits, five and six years old, inventing stuff and then proudly displaying their inventions to their parents. Now, because of the pandemic, a lot of this has had to move, had to move online, but there are wonderful online offerings of Tinker Lab programming where kids invent stuff and make stuff at home. And that is the precursor to, to developing the curiosity and skills and comfort that children need to be comfortable in the STEAM disciplines. And one of the very important things that Latimer's life underscores is that in many parts of the country and in many communities in the country, the schools that serve low-income and marginalized children do not have the courses that lead to competence in the STEAM disciplines. They don't have them in the elementary schools. They don't have them in the junior high schools. And if you don't get exposed to those courses early, then it's hard to pick it up when you're in junior high school. And if you don't pick it up in junior high school, you really lost at sea by the time you get to high school or college. So Latimer's life shows us how important mastery of the STEAM disciplines is. And it underscores why we have to make those experiences accessible to every child in this country. 
whether it's in school and or out of school. That's <laughs> families that have resources do, and there are a lot of families that don't have the resources. And so <laughs> with the museum are trying to pitch in to do our part, but we also need a policy agenda, which focuses on persuading schools to make sure that those opportunities are available to all kids. Spot on, <laughs> spot on, appreciate that. Uh, Steve, final word. Oh, uh, I don't know. We um, uh, uh, we can celebrate uh, where where we've uh, celebrate his life, uh, celebrate where we are, uh, but keep pushing. That was that's that's Latimer in in one in one phrase. Keep pushing. Keep pushing. Well, folks, um, again, join me in thanking both Hugh and Steve uh, for the webinar today. I knew it was going to be fun. Um, hoping that you found it uh, not only enjoyable, in, but informative. And so um, next month, Women's History Month, we'll be coming with programming then, third Wednesday of every month at 2 p.m. Remind you to visit the AIDS website where we have information for our 45th National Conference. And uh, you know we're looking forward, we'll be in Tampa, and we want to see you there and participate with you there. Uh, signing off for Abe, our February webinar. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you. All right. Thank you, gentlemen.